Good. Hi everybody, um, today we are going to be live in just a moment with Shane Benzie, but first of all I've just got to do the promo, um, I've got some promo for the podcast and the live broadcast these days, um, which is by Karans, so I just need to tell you a little bit about these um, little purple capsules that I've been taking lately to um, boost my immune system and also to make me less tired hopefully. Um, so this episode is sponsored by Karans, the blackcurrant extract from New Zealand. Um, so oh, yes that's what I was going to say they helped me with my latest half marathon recovery um, and they're a family owned company and they've just been crowned a sports nutrition product champion at the European Specialist Sports Nutrition Awards 2022 um, so I have arranged a 40% discount um, which is just here for anybody who's interested in trying Karans um, there's also a link in the film description below and in the podcast show notes as well so I just found that they've been helping me so I just wanted to, to share the Karans love um, but fantastic more um more on that later well i'll give you the discount again at the end of the show but let me introduce you to today's guest who is none other than amazing movement expert shane benzi from running reborn who has written a fascinating book called the art the lost art of running um which i've also linked to in the film description below and so today um we're going to be discussing the most common movement mistakes that we might be making and um we're going to come away with three things that we can all be trying to do to make our movement more efficient, more graceful and more easy and our running therefore more enjoyable. Um, so welcome Shane, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, how are you? Yes, I'm really good, thank you. Yeah, um, it's really nice to be here and I just realised when I was putting the show together that you have been on the show um, on Wild Ginger Running about five times now, this is your fifth time. Um, wow. So welcome back. <laughs> Excellent. Good to be here. And I've also realised in all the time that you have been, that I've been talking to you, we've met as well. I, I never realised, having just re re read a, the start of your book, I've, I've never realised that you started off your career working with sharks. That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, before I was studying human movement, I was uh, looking at sharks and I still I still work with them now. Uh, in fact, in uh, in January, I'm in Norway uh, on an ex expedition with orcas, with killer whales, a six day diving uh, expedition with them. So, yeah, I still uh, I still work with them. Fascinating creatures. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Um, and the other thing that stood out from your book was that you found that your nerves are on starting ultra running and doing doing ultra running. The nerves were similar to those you'd experienced just before in entering shark infested waters. Really? <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think actually the more times you get in with sharks, actually, I think they get a bit of a bad rep. They're actually not that scary, to be honest with you. So, um, and some of the some of the ultra marathons are pretty scary. So I think actually the gap, the gap's probably closer than you think. <laughs> I know, but surely with the ultras, there's not actually a real danger of death. I mean, you know, it's, you're going to hurt definitely in some way, but no one's going to bite well, your arm off at a checkpoint. Unless well, they're no, really hungry. No, no, I think you're right. But yeah, it's just how how you, I guess how you build things up, isn't it, in your mind and and how you prepare for something. And actually, a lot of the work I'm doing now, we've never really discussed this, but a lot of the work I'm doing now is uh, on the mind. Um, I, for a long time now, I've thought that movement is all about rewriting your software rather than teaching your body a new trick. But I'm looking a lot now at the, the mind and how we get into this kind of flow state and how we learn things and how we prepare for things. It's very much, uh, you know, a mental thing. Um, so, yeah, it's not odd that if, you, if you've got an event coming up, then, um, yeah, you can create it into this huge thing, this scary thing if you're not careful. Yeah. And I, sometimes, it, yeah, kind of rationalise it a little bit. Yeah, I think that I'm really excited for that, um, the mind and the flow um, ideas that you've got, because I have got quite a lot of ultras coming up this coming year, and... I have been building it up in my head as this really scary thing. And so I had to reframe it for myself as ultra hiking because a lot of it is hiking, isn't it? And that made it less scary and that makes it more doable. So so that is really, really interesting. And so as part of that flow, um, is that to do with the, the sort of the technique of the movement or is it just like motivation in general? Is it Does the flow situation help you with doing that efficient movement that you've been studying for years? Yeah, I think it does. And so, yeah, so my my big challenge is 
uh, when I'm coaching people to, to change their movement or, or to move better. Um, it really, it, you know, it's a, it's a discussion, it's a software thing, and it's a very cognitive thing. So if movement, is, if movement changes a software thing, you have to really think about doing it. Okay. Yeah. And so it, my work now is not just about the information that I give, but how you get that person receiving the information in the right state of mind to be able to take that information on and do something with it. Um, oh. And especially when they're on their own practicing, if we can get the mind in the right place, then it's a lot easier to be cognitive and, and, and to concentrate. That's so, really interesting. But, I've seen the. I've spent a lot of time in East Africa. That we, you know, we've discussed that before in Ethiopia and Kenya. I very much see the the runners go into this flow state when they group running, training, and stuff. But I'm also spending a lot of time now with people doing extreme sports. So big wave surfers, uh, kite surfers, climbers that do these extreme sports where they really have to be super focused and really thinking about what they're doing and nothing else around it. Um, and that kind of feeds back and kind of tells me, well, that's what I'm studying and researching now, is how to get into the flow states to be able to be extremely cognitive and just to let everything around you calm down so that you can really think about the task at hand. Wow, that's so interesting because when you do get into that flow state in running, it is a really nice feeling. Um, and I know Chris Bonington has talked about that flow state as well with his rock climbing in the past as well. So it's it's a definitely a thing. And I, I don't think there's that much on it really, is there? So it's fantastic yeah. that this is going to be like your new thread of research. Yeah, it's yeah, it's really interesting. I say it's very much I'm very much working on it now and trying to understand it. And I think like anything, we I think we often if you speak to people, they often say, Oh yeah, no, I've experienced that and, and it was amazing. But then it kind of goes and it's like anything, it's trying to harness it, isn't it? So yeah, the yeah. more you can understand something, the more hopefully you can kind of not just drop into it at will, but create an environment where you find it. Yes. And, uh, it's like free energy, what... isn't it? The flow state is like free energy. It's like effortless energy. Yeah, and, and, and a lot like elastic energy. So we've got this physical elastic energy that we use uh, for movement. That's what I get really excited about. And then, yeah, it's trying to get the brain in the same kind of working in the same way. And also looking at neuroplasticity as well. So we have an incredibly elastic brain um but it's amazingly good at rejuvenating and re-architecting itself um, just like the, the physical body so there very much should be we tend to kind of differentiate them so there's a, I'm doing a lot of work with that um and focusing on the, um, extreme athletes doing the extreme sports obviously lots of runners but 12 other sports actually um and also looking at tribes and indigenous people as well as to how they go into flow when they're doing some amazing things with their bodies and their minds. Amazing. Well, interesting stuff. Yeah, oh, that's that's really awesome. I'm really excited about that. And I, I think um, we can talk about that a bit later as well when I ask you what's coming next. Um, but I just, I, I want to find out more about you, Shane, because I know that you do these shark dives now, which I didn't know before. Um, but I, I just want to know a little bit about how you personally got into running and ultra running. Like why, why did you take this journey into becoming a movement coach yourself? Yeah, so so I kind of got into running actually quite quite late in life, um, and did the usual thing of, of I think I did the first thing I did was like kind of a village ten k, and um, had a bit of fun, you know didn't do any training just rocked up and ran <laughs> you know and uh, yeah, enjoyed it that was good fun and then just progressively did a little bit more and a little bit more and then uh, I ended up doing a fifty mile ultra which was uh, along the ten path and did that and like that and felt pretty beaten up afterwards but but kind of loved it i think i probably spent most of the 50 miles saying i'm never going to do this again and then, <laughs> yeah no one is signed up for the next one and went through that just sort of did more and more and then one day i signed up for a race called uh the grand union canal race yeah well, which you may not know and that's that's 145 miles long yeah from from Birmingham to london down the grand it sounds horrendous. And, uh, <laughs> Just a longer canal. Uh, it's a long way. Really and flat. It's very flat. It sounds good. No, it, it sounds, sounds awful. Good. 
and uh, and to be honest, I wasn't really prepared for it, and and kind of, but, but I just took it on. I mean, like I try and do everything else, I just took it on and and failed. I think I got to about the seventy five mile mark, and my left knee was really really painful, hurting, and I just couldn't carry on. And so, and then the next year, I I, I managed to get a place again, and this time trained really hard, bought all the gear. And, um, you know, was very, very fit, I thought, and um, was ready to take this race on. And I got to about the 100-mile mark, and then my ne- left knee went again. Oh, and, no. uh, it up, ended up DNFing again. And it was oh. at that point, I, right, what am I going to do here? Because I can't get any physically fitter, um, and I've got all the gear, and I felt very strong, and yet I just couldn't do this race. And so I kind of narrowed it down. I guess almost by process of elimination, but maybe it's the way I'm running. So I just kind of went on my own journey, really, to try and find a better way to run, to have a better running technique. But there wasn't a lot, and everything was on treadmills, and everything was talking about biomechanics, and, and it just kind of didn't really make sense to me. Um, but I got more and more into it and got really interested into, into it. And then I, I actually went out to America and thought, well, the best way to maybe learn is to become a coach so um you know if, if, if you learn to become a coach in theory you know a lot about the subjects so i went out to america and qualified as a coach and came back and started coaching and loved it absolutely fell in love with it cool uh, but still had some really big gaps in my knowledge because again everything was still based on the treadmill and everything was still based on biomechanics and it just didn't feel natural to me and when i was watching the tv and, and watching uh, the East Africans run on television, they weren't moving the way that I was coaching people to run. And in the end, I just thought, right, this isn't really working. So I just kind of down on tools and thought, right, I'm just going to go and find those runners. I'm just going to go and hang out with those runners in Ethiopia and Kenya and find out why they move the way we do and why we move kind of the way we do in the Western world. And, and that's what I did. And that was 12 years ago. And I'm still doing it now and chasing it all around the world. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I thought it was so interesting the way um, you just you you took your knowledge from watching the sharks move in your all your shark diving work. And you said you'd never just watch sharks in a tank and go, oh, this is how sharks move. And yet we there we were relying on research from treadmills um, to try and work out how humans run. So I think it's fun. It's absolutely fantastic that you were just like, no, I'm going to go to Ethiopia and then I'm going to go to Kenya and then I'm going to go everywhere in the world. You've been to so many places. Where, where have you been? I've just I've written it down here. You have been to <laughs> to uh oh yes yeah, so the rift valley to study kenyan athletes ethiopia uganda nepal amazon jungle um and even cardiff park run which is it's absolutely amazing <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. so so um uh, what uh, is it even possible to say in a nutshell what you learned like going around and seeing all these like n- native human populations presumably running like not without shoes necessarily but just like with the bare essentials not like covered in tech like w- w- is there a similarity between all these runners that you could say distill into sort of three main points or you know something that you're like right we've got to do this this and this does, does it work like that well yeah it kind of does so so you know i don't think it's breaking news anymore that humans were kind of designed to run so as you know 15,000 years ago we were we were kind of hunter gatherers so we would have done a lot of gathering and digging of roots and stuff like that but we also would have eaten meat and we would have chased that meat down so humans are very good or very well equipped to walk and run without a doubt but what's been fa- what's been fascinating about the journey is is that depending on what you believe but the, the general consensus is that kind of you know humans kind of sort of kind of evolved in in Africa in the Rift Valley and then kind of left the Rift Valley and populated the whole world really pretty much you know, we're pretty much everywhere now and but actually so humans have, have, have changed to adapt to their environment so if you look at someone from Kenya they will have a very different body shape from someone from outer Mongolia so I've spent time in outer Mongolia where it's extremely cold it's kind of minus 40 so people will have a completely different body shape because they need to hold the cold whereas someone who lives in the Rift Valley will have a different body shape because they need to radiate that heat so 
we our bodies have adapted all around the world to meet the environment that we're living in but we are all humans and there is a way for a human to run and a way for a human to walk and so that's kind of been my work as to understand what i what is the right way for them to do that and then understand why we don't anymore yeah why uh, don't we are there like some <laughs> common mistakes that we're all making as runners i'm really intrigued because i've got a, i've got quite a lot of ultras i've i've set myself up like all these targets for ultra running in 2023 and i really would like to know if i'm making some mistakes <laughs> well so our movement is governed by so running is a movement skill yeah it's a movement thing essentially so so and there are lots of things that affect our movement two of the big ones are our perception of our movement so by that what i mean is if you go for a run tomorrow morning how you feel about your movement and what you assume is happening as you move has a big influence on how you actually do that movement and, that, and in the Western world, our perception of our movement is based largely on our kind of standard view of biomechanics, which I think kind of gets us moving in a pretty mechanical way, because we tend to see our kind of, we're taught our movement is a series of levers, bones as levers powered by muscles, and it makes us feel mechanical and so forth. So therefore we move in a mechanical way. And then the other big influencer, there are lots, but the other big influencer is your running posture, running is largely about posture, your running posture is only ever going to be an extension of your everyday posture. So how you spec, yeah, exactly, so you start <laughs> sitting. sit up straight. Up. <laughs> so, and, and sitting is a thing these days, isn't it? So many of us in the Western world spent a lot of time sitting, mm. looking into one of these boxes and uh, doing what we do. Well, no matter what we do, we seem to spend most of our time just looking into a screen, yeah. doing something. And so the sea of tension that a human has in its body, this elastic sea of tension, has been severely compromised in the Western world and therefore isn't conducive to, to dynamic movement. So how we feel about our movement and the environment we live in have big, big, potentially negative effects on our movement. Now, we can adjust those and relearn those. That's, that's no problem at all. But that's what we have to do is relearn. It's, it's not a, a, a given right for a human anymore to be able to just run because our ancestors did. You know, we're not that animal anymore. And that's why the sharks were fascinating. And that's why I started the lost art of running with sharks, because sharks have been swimming around for 400 million years. Yeah. And in that 400 million years, really, their environment hasn't changed that much at all mm -hmm. um, until humans came along and we, we started to, to get rid of them. Harpooning, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But actually, they're doing what they were doing 400 million years ago, which is swimming around, having baby sharks and eating. That, yeah. That's really all they do. But they've got incredibly streamlined and amazing at this movement. Whereas humans, we've gone from being hunter gatherers. We've gone through being farmers, gone through the industrial revolution and now the technological revolution. So in the, in, in the space of just maybe 20,000 years, we've only been around 300,000. In the space of 20,000 years, we've gone through all those massive changes. So now a human is like a fish out of water. Yeah. You know, I'm not designed in this concrete box, no. you know. And I'm designed to sit all day. Um, and I'm not designed to sit in cars and planes and, and have phones which make your head come down. So we're no longer that animal. So it's a, it's a challenge for a human just to live in this modern world let alone run ultras in it. Yeah. So we, we have to think, really think about things. We think we've made things easier for ourselves, don't we? Because, you know, we're largely free of predators, infectious diseases. You know, we've, you know, we don't expect to die if we walk out of our front door. There's no saber-toothed tigers lurking around the corner or anything like that. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So now we have to do ultras and we have to train for them now, don't we? We can't just rock up and go, yeah. oh, I'm going to run 100 miles today. <laughs> But you know what's really interesting, actually, when, if you go back to the hunter-gatherers, in reality, the general consensus is that actually hunter-gatherers only ran maybe about a half marathon at yeah. about a four-hour pace. So they weren't running endlessly chasing animals down. That's We have this romantic notion, yeah. that, but I don't think that's true. So we were never great runners. We were incredibly good trackers, yeah. um, but not the best runners ever. But we can run long and slow. Yeah. Um, 
So in the name of sport, we want to take those amazing gifts that Mother gave us and then turn human into into human performance. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm glad you said that about half marathons because that's the distance that I usually do, you know, like with hardly any training, like, apart from I had a baby, so I had to kind of come back into it. But I've always thought, right, well, my main aim in life is to be half marathon fit. And then if I want to ramp up the volume, I'll go to marathon fit. And then if I want to do anything beyond that, I'll just use my marathon fitness and then I'll hike. <laughs> so yeah, I'll just do that. <laughs> but I, I was quite excited by... Um, uh, by the fact that I could talk to you about these two words that you used and you you got really excited about this word as well elastic you were very excited about the word elastic and then you told us all about the fascia in the book so why, why are you so excited about elasticity yeah I do I do go on about it a bit I could hear myself doing it. <laughs> that's great well, well when I first went to Africa and thought right I'm going to just go watch the, I'm going to go and live with these runners and I'm going to watch them and understand what's going on and, and I was there for about a month the first time I went. And, and I, yeah, I saw a very different movement from what I was seeing in, in, in the UK and, and anywhere else in Europe. Um, and I couldn't really understand what it was. And, but it did look elastic. It looked kind of synergistic, fluid, elastic, connected. But I didn't really know what it was. So I spent a lot of time watching them and, and chatting to them, often through translators uh, in, in many places trying to get a feel for how they felt about their movement. Um, and then when I came back to the UK after that trip, you know, and, and got onto some good Wi-Fi, then I was kind of thinking, right, OK, now I need to put my researchers on. It was then I became a researcher. But right, what was it I was seeing? And I think I probably typed in something like Elastic Runner or something like that and um, very quickly found fascia. And did it. I'd never really heard about it before. I didn't really know what it was, to be honest with you. Um, and then did a bit more Googling and a bit more research and then found uh, somebody that was doing um, some uh, work training workshops on fascia in London. And I thought, right, I'm going. I'm going to go and do that. So it was a weekend workshop. I signed up for the workshop and uh, got there. There was 20 of us. Everybody in the room was a kind of yoga teacher, pretty much. Uh, and I was the one person that was a kind of a coach. Uh, and uh, so I was wondering if I was on the right course, to be <laughs> honest with you. And I was the only guy as well. All the, all the, all the other people were females. Oh, really? And I was kind of thinking, should I be here? You know, have I, did, I, did I Google this wrong? I hope not, because it was quite expensive. And, uh, <laughs> but within five minutes of, of, the per, of, of, the, of the presenting starting, I just thought, yeah, this is it. This is what I was seeing. Because the person was talking about elastic energy, connective elastic tissue that runs from our toes all the way to the top of our head. And they were talking about our bones floating in a sea of elastic tension. And I just thought, that is what I saw. That is what I saw. Yeah. Um, and and the, the exciting thing about the word elastic, with many things that are exciting at, but one of the big exciting things about the word elastic is it doesn't really want oxygen and calories the way that muscles do. And it doesn't really produce lactate. So from a propulsion point of view, it's extremely efficient and economical and can make us incredibly dynamic. So we should be really into it. Yeah, it sounds amazing. It sounds like like free energy, a bit like the flow that we were talking about Ooh. earlier. Like look, you've got free energy in your body Ooh. with the elastic and then free energy with the flow. Um, so yeah. um, how do we tap into it? Like I'm guessing sitting down like this all day doing a computer job is not a great way to tap into the elastic flow, uh, the, yeah. like the elastic, the fascia. Um, could, do we have to like, yeah, how do we, how do we even grasp it? <laughs> how do we work out what happens? <laughs> Yeah, so you're right. So sitting sitting down all day, which is what a lot of us do, you definitely won't tap into it. And actually, you could argue, I don't even think it's an argument, you can really hinder it by by, by sitting a lot because we kind of weren't designed to do that. You know, if you, hang, if, if you spend time with tribes and indigenous people, they will work for about four hours during the day mm -hmm. and then just like... Oh, really? There's really yeah, there's really no sitting at all. Um, then we're squatting. Mm -hmm. uh, but just lying so no real sitting so sitting is a, a thing we've come up with yeah um and put this into a really strange position and i'm always using this um model that i that i use and i've always I'm never about a meter never more than a meter away from one of these but it, <laughs> but it, it kind of tells the story so 
if this is a it's a child's toy has your child got one of these yes or, and he's got one of those yeah someone sent uh, it one of my orienteering friends sent it <laughs> perfect yeah. so yeah it's a fitness toy but actually it's it's a ten sequity model okay and so the concept of ten sequity or bio ten sequity for you as a human is that the 206 bones that make your skeleton are essentially floating. They're not a structure. Mm -hmm. They're all floating. No bone touches another bone in your body. And so this toy really tells that story because if the wood is your bones and the elastic stuff, well, that's your tendons, ligaments, and my fascia. So essentially your skeleton, when you move, is free flowing mm -hmm. in this sea of elastic tension. That's why we want to get beautifully tall when we run because then we'd load that elastic tension. But the sea of tension you run with is only ever going to be decided in your everyday life. So if you were to spend most of your day sitting with your head down, you've now really compromised your sea of tension and there is no elastic energy in your body at all. So if you spend all of your time sitting, that's the, the tension your body adap uh, adapts to. It's not going to be very easy then to create this beautiful palsy of tension when you run. Ah, so, so you kind of get stuck in that position, do you? Like a bit yeah, stuck yeah. there? The, yeah, the, the body just wants to go back to its normal sea of tension. And that can be if you also if you kind of put all your weight onto one hip when you're stood and then the other foot kind of poking off at an angle, then you're really skewing your sea of tension like that. Ah. So we should be trying to check beautiful sea of tension where we have e e even weight on our hips on good height in our body. So if you could stand it, that would really, if you were stood on tripod feet, a nine lengthened spine, neutral pelvis with an engaged core, eye line on the computer working, breathing into the bottom third of your lungs, you're training. Ah, because I have got a standing desk. This is actually a standing desk. Um, but when I stand to work, um, it's much more tiring. And then I end up like after like an hour or so getting sore feet and then also, um, yeah, getting sore feet and then just sitting down again because it's easier. <laughs> is that a cop out or well, should I be trying to stand more, like stand for an hour, sit for an hour kind of thing? Completely, absolutely. You know, if you think back to when you first started running, mm. you didn't just go out and, and run a marathon or, or run an ultra. This is true. You built up to it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you start 20 minutes a day, twice a day for a few weeks, and then maybe make it half an hour for three times a day, just alternate. You know, don't throw your chair away, but alternate between the two. Okay. And I think sometimes you, you you have to sit. You can't stand all day. The trick is to keep moving. Mm. Um yeah. And I know for me, I have to, if I'm creating, then I sit. But if I concentrate, I have to sit. That's just the way it probably says more about me than, than, uh, <laughs> than, than concentrate. But so, yeah, I think you just move between the two. Yeah, move um, about. That makes really, it more doable, really just like those little bits building yeah. it up. Oh, that's really handy. Oh, so that's a good tip. Tip number one, stand if you can at your desk for a bit. And um, I noticed, didn't I, the, uh, as you, um, as I called you on Skype, I was like, ah, oh, I can see Shane is standing. And I don't know how that I could tell, and you could tell that I was sitting. <laughs> and I just thought yeah. that was really funny how I could immediately tell that you were standing, um, even though I didn't know that you would be standing, but you usually do. So <laughs> I should really have known that. <laughs> um, so that's really really interesting. I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about cadence and overstriding because there's this big thing isn't there in the western world about you know you wear these big padded shoes and we heel strike and I just wondered where your thoughts were on that because there's also a school of thought that says oh we must land on the front of the foot we must land on the toes perhaps um uh, yeah I know you've coached me through this before so I do actually know the answer but from your point of view uh, has anything changed and what what should we be doing heel striking or midfoot striking or what what should we do okay yeah okay good yeah i mean it's a good question because it's fundamental and it's something that everybody talks about also but to go back to your first point uh, about cadence mm. the cadence is a really interesting one because i think there is a right cadence to run at okay and, and i believe that cadence zone that we should run at is between 175 and 185 okay i think that's where we should be but I've looked at now at over 4,000 runners, okay, 
uh, and looked at things like cadence, ground contact time, vertical oscillation, stride length, vertical ratio, all sorts of things. And, and uh, the, of, the, of those 4,000 runners in the Western world, the average cadence is 163. Okay. So the av- if there is an average runner, they're running around at a cadence of 163. And 84% of those runners were landing on a heel mm-hmm. on a straight leg. Mm-hmm. So they were overstriding and running at a cadence of 163. Mm-hmm. So what happened some time ago is that people thought, right, okay, well, we don't want people landing on a heel on a straight leg overstriding. What, and they're running at a slow cadence. What we'll do is we'll up their cadence so that they take shorter strides, so that they no longer land on the heel on a straight leg. Now, that hasn't solved anything. That's just making you shuffle around with tiny little strides. So you might not be heel striking anymore, but you've now got the stride length of a field mouse. It's very, very small. And the moment you try and run fast, you're just going to overstride again. So we mustn't use cadence to correct. Okay, that's really interesting because I was reading this book by um, uh, uh, the Born to Run guys, Chris McDougall and Eric Wharton, um, and they say Run to Rock Lobster by B52 because it's the perfect cadence for running. It's like 180 cadence. Um, And I tried running to Rock Lobster. I played it four times. (laughs) It was quite intense. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And... um, and uh, I, I did have to like speed up my cadence. So I think I'm your average 165 cadence runner. Oh dear. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it did make me have to run faster, but it just wore me out. I, I know I probably should just do a little bit each run rather than trying to do it four times in one run, but it, it did wear me out. And uh, maybe I'm doing what you just said there, just doing cadence and not addressing any of the other things. Yeah, yeah. So we, we need to check. Yeah, we need to change our gait to, to stop us heel striking and over striding. Interestingly, if Rock, if Rock Lobster got you running at an 880 cadence, that would be good because actually that's banging in the middle of 175 to 185. And the reason we'd want to be in that cadence zone is that actually our body has an elastic frequency. Okay. So when we're running, we hit the ground and but about two and a half times our body weight coming back at us when we hit the ground. That impact coming back into us is a beautiful thing because it turns into elastic energy. So we hit the ground, create a load of elastic energy. We store that as we go through the stride. And then as we leave the ground, the elastic energy fires. So if you run at a cadence between 175 and 185, the the feeling is that you're sinking in with the elastic frequency of your body. I did feel bouncy. I felt bouncy. I felt bouncy yeah. and I felt n- nimble. Like, is that a yeah. good word to describe? Nimble and nifty and bouncy. That's how I felt. But it did, it was a bit more tiring because obviously I'm, I'm not used to the quicker leg turnover. But I'll, I'll try it again yeah. now. You've given me faith. Yeah, so, so, so the cadence is important because it gets you moving with your elastic frequency, not to correct your form, okay? And, and actually, the reason it was probably more tiring is your breathing locks itself into your cadence and so if you're used if you are a one six if you're that average runner running at a one six three cadence your breathing is used to that if you suddenly up your cadence your breathing wants to track that which means it gets very shallow yeah um, and uh, don't get as much in i did feel like i was confused as to when i should breathe like i was kind of thinking oh maybe i'll breathe every two steps rather than like i i, I had to think about it rather than just go for a run um, so it was really interesting yeah. probably probably three steps in and three steps out is probably about right okay. there's no one size fits all but yeah if you breathe in for three steps breathe out for three steps that ensures that the breathing still stays um linked to the movement but it ensures it stays slow as well so uh, that's a that's a good thing okay oh thanks uh, good tip and then and then from a point of view of footfall yeah so i i talk all the time about a tripod landing okay and so essentially a tripod landing i also have a foot i've also got i've also got a technology model and a, and a model and a foot all. you've always so got your baby's toys tripod. available haven't you <laughs> <laughs> that's just where i that's my mentality <laughs> so a tripod landing is essentially a point on the heel a point under where the ball of the big toe is and then a point under where the ball of the underneath the little toe would be and then 
it creates a triangle or a tripod. So actually a good landing, I think, is the whole of the foot coming down at the same time to make that tripod landing. Okay, and is that, that what you've observed then in every single um, indigenous running community that hasn't been well, put in Not in every single, yeah, not in every single, but oh, that's looking at um, runners all around the world and the general consensus is, and, and looking at lots of people in tribes and indigenous people, that's how they, they should land. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, they, if, you watch, if you watch people run very, very quickly, if they're sprinting, then they might go on to more of the fore of the front of the foot. Yeah. But, that's only really sprinting. Anything other than sprinting, we should be getting that tripod landing. Because what tripods give us, my iPad is on a, on a tripod while I'm talking to you. And the reason it's on a tripod is because I want it to be stable. And that's what a tripod landing gives us, is massive stability. Mm -hmm. If we land here or here, then we don't get that stability. Yeah, I remember okay. when I came to see you, you showed me the amount of nerve endings that are in the heel, and there's hardly any nerve mm. endings in the heel. So if you land with your heel first, your body's not getting very good information about what's happening on the ground. Um, and there's loads of nerve endings in, in this part of the foot, in the midfoot and towards the toe area. So that's that um, you want to be planting it all down at the same time. Um, how do we actually do that? Like, is, is, Can we go out and practice something to enable us to tripod land you can i mean i think the biggest the biggest the biggest thing that can really hang for everybody watching or listening to this the biggest thing you can do is to get inside video yourself video okay. mm -hmm. it's so so important and we can all do it we've all got a phone now and probably all got a tablet pretty much that you can buddy up with someone or actually just put your phone down run past it and you will immediately know what you're doing. Because of those 84% of people that, that, that were heel strike on and on a straight leg, a, a, a good half of those didn't know that they were. Mm -hmm. Because you quite rightly said, there are no nerves on the heel. So you just don't know that you're doing it. And your trainers are probably built in a way where it's going to mask it as well. So the first thing everybody should do tomorrow is to get, and I don't want to do myself out of a job here, but <laughs> the first thing they should do is get outside and run up and down and video themselves doing it. They will know instantly whether they're a heel striker or a four foot striker or a tripod lander. That's the first thing you should do because before you can change anything, you need to know what you're currently doing. Yes, yeah, oh, that's really, really good advice. Um, yeah. yeah, I do actually recommend that everybody does go and book in with Shane for um, uh, a gait, well, it's not a gait analysis, is it? But it's a, a, like a movement analysis and you, you know, you strap things to people and then you play it back on the computer screen. You can see it in really, really super, super slow motion. It's really, really interesting. Um, and it is a really, really beneficial thing to do, especially if you actually listen to Shane and do the things that he says. <laughs> um, um, but we have got some... Um, uh, I, <laughs> We've got some, I just want to read you out some live, people are just saying hello on the live chat, so I just wanted to read out um, some questions for you. And if you have got any questions live for Shane, then do just send them in just now. Um, but I just wanted to um, just send you this message from Andrew Knox. Um, he said, um, say hi to Shane. I had a couple of half day sessions with him um, yeah. after seeing the first video that you did with him. So that's good. He really... I remember him. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. He's a lovely guy. Um, uh, Hannah Basley says she uh, recently started reading Shane's book. Must time, find time to finish it. She's a busy mum, so she will find time. <laughs> Andrea is here. Uh, Taduez Campwell is here. He says hi. Mike Kayla says hi. And Mike also says that he's also definitely out of breath when he ups his cadence. Um, and Andrea mm. says, oh, a new book to read. It's now on my Kindle. So you've sold at least two <laughs> <laughs> during the course of this broadcast. Well done. <laughs> um, but while we're talking about um the while we've talked about the overstriding a thing and what we can do um is oh sorry my cat has just decided to join the broadcast my door doesn't shut properly um so <laughs> um so posture must come into it then like the position of the head and the arms like as runners we think all about our legs don't we but Mm. How important is posture um, and the position of uh, our head and our arms during running? Should we should we bother thinking about those things? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's that's one of the things with our kind of like standard view of biomechanics. It would kind of get you really thinking that you run with your legs. 
and you almost carry your upper body with you because you kind of can't leave it behind really whereas really in in reality the fingertips on your left hand are connected to the toes on your right foot there are no dividing lines in your body only connecting lines so we must start to think of our body as just one complete thing yeah absolutely fundamental so getting height in the body, so we were talking about that 10 segwity toy a little while ago and talking about if you get nice and tall, you load it and you get elastic. So a really good way of, of kind of, and a simple way, because we just need to try and make everything as simple as we possibly can here, is to imagine you've got something, and I, in the book I talk about it, it's called your centre line. And it's an, it's an imaginary line, but it's a line that runs from your belly button up through your abdomen, up through your chest, underneath your chin, to the top of your head. It's a continuous line. And when you run, you just want to imagine that you're opening up and putting a bow in to that center line. And if you watch most beautiful runners running, they seem to have this kind of bow in the chest and this beautiful, elegant height in their body. And so getting that bow in your center line kind of gets you into that position. It gets the hips forward, which is more likely to get your pelvis into a neutral position, which will engage your core. And it ensures that you get your upper body over your center of gravity. So gravity is going to start to help you. And it loads the elastic energy in your body as well. So that one simple line, if you just put a bow into it when you run, kind of makes all these amazing things happen. You make it sound very simple. (laughs) Well, we've spent quite a few decades now really complicating this Mm -hmm. and thinking of all different types of things and angles and explanations and, you know, some of the most beautiful movers in the world that I've seen all around the world in, in jungles and rainforests and deserts and places all around the world, they're not thinking about it at all because they never forgot how. And so they just move, you yeah. know, they just do it. And so I think we've got to decomplicate it just and think of just a few simple things that if we get right, it makes all the beautiful stuff in the background. And that's that. So that sense of line and change everything honestly it's, it's so simple but really effective brilliant so we've all we all need to video ourselves we need to stand mm-hmm. tall um we need to uh, try to run at 180 cadence perhaps with rock lobster on to start with just so that we get the idea of it <laughs> um and and try to place our foot as a, as a tripod kind of all down the whole thing down at the same time um so and then not sit all the time at a desk so that that's four brilliant takeaways that people can take out of this podcast or or this live broadcast that's fantastic yeah and but actually on the cadence thing i wouldn't try and run a 180 cadence if you get your movement good and you get your interaction with the ground good that will reduce your ground contact time which will allow your cadence to go up. So I think actually we shouldn't really be running around listening to something to make our feet go to a certain rhythm because it will just shorten our stride and make us shuffle. Mm -hmm. I think do want to chase the cadence between 175 and 185, but that should come as a result of moving well. Yeah. So I think chicken and egg, I think. So the cadence should come as a result. It shouldn't be the dictating factor that if we run at that cadence, we assume we're doing well. And I think that's what that's where we're going wrong to a large degree. Yeah, okay, yeah. So it's like, it's the culmination of the things rather than the thing. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. thank you. There's loads of free tips there. Um, I do urge people to buy Shane's book because it is a brilliant read. It's really well written. Like you've been to all these beautiful countries and you describe them so well. It really is a real joy to read. Um, and I, I wanted to say, um, well, I wanted to ask you what is next because you, we did cover it slightly at the beginning, but um, now people will more fully understand um, what we're talking about. So, yeah, what, what is next for you, apart from diving with the killer whales, obviously? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah so diving with orcas is very next, but then I'm in and out to City doing some work there and then straight to India. So, and lots, lots of, uh, yeah, lots more traveling working on uh, another book um, to uh, follow up from the original, um, which is still about running, still about movement, um, but looks more at this flow state. It indicates that a lot more and delves into that a lot more. Looks at the power of the group. I'm always seeing how powerful we are as a group. We interact together. So I'm really excited about that. Um, 
the past with neuroplasticity. I'm getting more into that, how we can learn how to pull all of these things kind of into action. So a lot of traveling for the book and a lot more research. I've got a, uh, I'm working with the University of East London on a research project at the moment, which is amazing. Tokyo shortly, uh, and then Africa. And that's 20 sensors that go all over the body. Wow. And when you're running outside, it creates a 3D version of you running outside. Wow. With so much that you couldn't imagine. But also, it's collecting oxygen and CO2 levels as well. Wow. So you can actually see a 3D model of somebody running, look at all the data, look at how hard that person is working to run in that way. That's going to change because we're going to be able to put data and technology against things that I think I think I see. It, you know, it looks as if potentially the ability to increase your economy by up to thirty percent by changing the way that you move. Wow, that's I mean, amazing! It, it's extra. It's, it's extraordinary because you'd have to work really hard to increase your VO two or lactate threshold by a few percent to be, increase your economy. By that is just extraordinary. So that we're, we're testing, working with that at the moment, and we're we're off to um, uh, uh, to to do some research there, and then we're to do some more research. But that'll go all around the world, wow. looking at how everyone moves around the world and creating these three D models of them, and understanding what the toll is on the engine for them to do those tasks. So. We'll learn so much from that. That's, that's going to be amazing. Well, that sounds incredible. Sorry, it cut out slightly. Did you say Japan and and then, yeah, Japan? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So interestingly, outside of Ethiopia and Kenya, the Japanese are the best running uh, marathon running nation. Yeah. And so, how? Why? Why is that? And they do move very differently. Ah. So, so the research project is going to look at how we move in Europe. How the Japanese runners are moving, and then how the East African runners are moving. Three very different movement patterns. And then we're going to try and, yeah, try and understand why, what, what's effective about all of them and what's potentially debilitating with some of them and why they work and why they don't. And, you know, we have to try, trying to narrow down what is good, efficient, dynamic movement. And I think this is going to, this will, this will, this will open up some new ideas, I'm sure, and hopefully confirm some things that, I think I can see, but you can just never put data against. And of course, all of this is outside, so it's not on a treadmill. So it's all outside, which makes it very relevant because I think if you just try and cram the natural world into a laboratory and put it on a treadmill, even though you're getting data from it, the data doesn't relate to how it would be if you ran outside. So this is this 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 should hopefully change a, a lot of things it sounds amazing and it, it does sound amazing mm -hmm. the work you're doing with the mind as well like you know how you can you can see it all technically in the body but then you're talking about how we then change our mind because it's our mind essentially which kind of controls the body or controls changes in the body and I just think that's really interesting because I was also talking to um the the guy Nick Knight he's given me some physio exercises to improve my calf um because I'm injured and he said half the battle for him in his appointments is he's like a sort of a psychologist trying to understand what will make that person do the exercises it's not that they can't do the exercises but they just for some reason won't fit it into their day or they just you know forget so half of the battle is in the mind so I just thought that was really Really interesting that that's your next field of study because it seems to be um or everything's moving in that direction it's, it is it's it's everything i mean the, you know i always think of the, the, the yeah the mind the brain as the software and the physical body as the hardware well you can get new hardware mm. but it's it, it's software that, that really counts and i think yeah we're learning a lot more about the body and we understand the body ever better but the mind the brain we don't even know what we don't know. <laughs> the, yeah. So much, so much work to be done there. And I think what's, what I get really excited about is looking outside of running. In fact, looking outside of sport sometimes, because I think sometimes if we just look at the same thing all the time, we stop seeing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm working in, uh, in uh, Mexico City with the IPA on actually 12 different sports. 
So not just looking at running, but 12 different sports from a movement point of view and a, and a mind process point of view. But then, yeah, you take it even further afield and, and, and look at what uh, tribes and indigenous peoples are doing and how they're thinking about things. Looking at cultural effects on human locomotion, so rituals and uh, all of that sort of stuff, dance rituals. So all of these things kind of do, they give you a much wider picture of, 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 of what is happening with the mind. But then how you focus that onto a task, which is running. So, yeah, it's, it's exciting. The more you, every time you overturn a stone, yeah. you, you find something, you think, ah, oh, okay. But then it leads to another two stones and another two stones. <laughs> So the work seems to get ever wider, but all the time it's funneling back into into the running. Um, but yeah, everywhere you go, it seems to be more this yeah. than, than the physical. It's so um, fascinating. It, uh, yeah, it just it sounds like an amazing career. You just like follow following your research and following your heart at the same time. And and when you mentioned about the flow, I think every every runner knows about the flow. Like you can get into this flow state where you just feel like things are effortless. And to be able, like you said, like maybe through your research to be able to harness that more effectively, um, it would be brilliant, wouldn't it? I just yeah, if you could bottle that and sell it, you'd be a millionaire. <laughs> Yeah, even, I mean, there's loads more work to be done on it, loads. Uh, but I've just been in Australia for a month um, work, uh, researching and presenting um, and doing a lot of research on the flow stuff out there. And even now, even in this short, maybe I've been working on it for about six months. Um, I understand a lot better. That's given me loads more t stones to unturn. But already I can, I can kind of see, put some thought processes behind stuff that I see all of the time. Um, and it's just piecing them together. And every now and again, you get this massive light bulb go off. You think, ah, oh, right, OK, I get that. And you start to piece it together. And I think you're getting there. And I think, um, yeah, if you could if you can drop into that flow state easier um, and just be able to harness it, um, I, that would be incredible. But, you know, we can do that with meditation and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, and often there aren't big differences between all of these things. Yeah, because so, I, uh, I was just thinking, is it about relaxing? Because I absolutely hate meditating. I just think it's a complete waste of time for me personally. I just end up like thinking about like my organising my life in it. But when I go running, I believe that is where I do my meditation because I'm, you know, not necessarily thinking about anything or if I am, I'm having great ideas for stuff. And, you know, it just creates that space. But for me, it has to be that rhythm kind of like breathe in breathe out thump 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 like it, it's that and that is my meditation I think yeah yeah absolutely and so yeah so it's just trying to understand that better um and um, interviewing loads of people working with lots of people you know I get to work with some great athletes um or you know I'm I'm sharing my thoughts with them on movement and I get them to move better but also I'm learning from them as well I mean the book in, in the lost art of running there's some incredible runners in there just incredible runners and i've worked with them all i only ever have i only talk about any talk about people that, I, that i've spent time with whether it's to understand from them or to teach and so the information you get back is incredible yeah absolutely incredible so and it just built this, this this pot just gets bigger and bigger of all these thought processes for learning for people do amazing things and not just elite athletes, but people who, everyday people who've just done incredible things. Um, and you learn more and more and more about kind of what works. So, uh, yeah, so to come, it's just loads more. Fantastic. Um, so how do people find out more about you and the courses that you run and, and to buy your book? And I've, got, I've put a link to The Last Art of Running in the film script description below. But how, how will people follow you and find out more and join Running Reborn well, I, as well? Yeah, so I guess so. So um, Running Reborn it has a, has a website. Runningreborn.com has a website, and that kind of um, that keeps you up to date with everything that I'm doing. There's a coaching there's a coaching page there, so I do lots of one to one coaching, like group workshops, and travel all around the country working with run clubs and all of that sort of stuff. So if people uh, think they can get a number of runners together, then I can. Kind of come to you and come work with you or I work from the pavilion which you've been down to in Goring uh, where people can come to me and then I'm coaching there but I work all over Europe as well and well I've just come back from Australia doing it and Dubai um, so I'm I'm all over the world doing that so yeah the website will, will tell you everything and there's information 
on the book there as well. Brilliant. I'll put a link to your website in the film description below as well, um, so people can yeah. click on it really easily there. But if not, just Google Running Reborn. Um, uh, it's absolutely fantastic to have you on, Shane. It's, um, the book is a real joy. I really recommend it to everybody, The Lost Art of Running. And really good luck in working on your next one as well. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, well, when it's out, I'll give you a shout and we'll, uh, we'll do this again. Definitely. That sounds brilliant. Thank you so much, Shane. And, um, and oh, yeah, everybody, everybody on the live chat says it's absolutely fantastic as well. So that's really great to hear. Um, Mad Paul in particular says, hi, it sounds so interesting. <laughs> so it's just a snapshot of the conversation that's been going down. <laughs> brilliant. So thank you so much, Shane. Um, and just to finish, I'll just um, just do the uh, little bit of Karan's sponsorship that we have to do this broadcast is sponsored by Karans. It's a blackcurrant extract from New Zealand um, that I've been experimenting with. They just won um, a, a nutrition award at the Europe European Sports Specialist Nutrition Awards uh, 2022. And um, I, I'm really pleased with the effect they've been having on my recovery, on my uh, feeling immune to all Finley's colds, and also um, on my energy levels in particular, they've picked right up. So um, if you are interested to try Karans for yourself, um, then I do have a 40% discount off uh, just at the top of the screen there. Um, so if you want to click on that, uh, that will give you 40% off. And there's also a link in the film description below and the podcast show notes as well. So um, thank you very much, Shane. And we will be hearing from you when right your new book is out. That would be absolutely brilliant to have you back on the show for a sixth time. <laughs> and we can talk about the diving with the orcas and everything as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Shane, and I will see you soon. All right, take care. Bye-bye.